This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Shapeshift.io. With no account or sign up required, it's the easiest way to buy and sell Litecoin, Dogecoin, Darkcoin, and other leading cryptocurrencies. Go to Shapeshift.io to instantly convert altcoins and to discover the future of cryptocurrency exchanges. Hello, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. So we're here today with uh, Thomas Föcklin. He has actually been working uh, in the same office as I have for, for a few months now. And uh, many of you will, will know him or will know his wallet, the, the thing he's been working on, which is Electrum. So um, one of the most popular Bitcoin wallets. So thanks so much for joining us today, Thomas. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Now, what's interesting is that you guys are actually just separated by a wall. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we're actually like uh, five meters apart. I, yeah, yeah. I, I am in the modern room with the white wall, whereas, whereas uh, Thomas is sitting with an old-fashioned wallpaper, which also represents the, <laughs> the kind of traditional values that Electrum has. No. Well, um, you, you may put it like that. Actually, it's the Ethereum office. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the, the Ethereum office where I was actually staying this weekend, uh, I actually just got back to Lille about three hours ago. Um, I had a, about a, I woke up about three thirty this morning to uh, come back to Lille from Berlin. I had been there all week, and Brian and I attended the uh, Inside Bitcoin to Berlin conference and worked and did all kinds of cool stuff while we were there. Uh, so, Brian, what did you think of the conference? Yeah, I mean, I enjoyed it. You know, as uh, Inside Bitcoin's guys always do a, a good job organizing it. You know, they're definitely very professional at it. Um, that being said, one definitely noticed that, you know, this is not like Bitcoin at a thousand dollars or something. So in terms of attendance, uh, you know, it was pretty dramatic. I think how much it's gone down from last year to this year. I mean, I mean, I, I, let's, let's, let's remember last year when we came back from the Berlin conference, we were filled with such energy and like, you know, things were happening. We were on the cusp of something huge. And this year there's about half as many people. There's definitely a different atmosphere. I guess you could say the sort of like the diehard uh, people that like sort of stand behind the blockchain technology were there. Um, so there was sort of filtering out of people that perhaps were not so serious about it um back back uh, a year ago uh but yeah it was nice to see everybody and by the way you gave a great talk uh which uh we we recorded we may be putting it out sometime yeah well thanks um, uh yeah i mean uh, i guess to uh most listeners they will be familiar with the topic because it's it's basically the same thing that we did our last episode on um but yeah, no, I, I mean, I think one thing this really illustrates is just how much the price is driving uh, attention, you know, and people getting involved in the community. I mean, I've been also been noting is that with the meetup, uh, we, we get less people, you know, it's less attendance and there's just somehow less energy with everything. And then hopefully that's going to change, you know, I mean, uh, I hope hopefully this year it's going to, you know, pick up again and uh, of course we, many people sort of say that the price doesn't matter and you know, it's obviously not true. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was great to be there anyway. It was, it was really cool to be in the Ethereum office uh, for some uh, late night uh, coding sessions. I, I mean, uh, this weekend when I was saying that I, I'd get back around midnight and um, I had my I had my laptop set up with a big screen. And it's just something about being in that office. It just makes you want to write code. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so let's uh, get right into it then. Um, so, you, so Electrum's been around for, for a couple of years. And uh, in fact, you just released a version 2.0, which we can talk about uh, a bit later. Uh, so can you just broadly explain what is Electrum? So Electrum is a lightweight Bitcoin client. And it's also a server. It's a client server architecture. Um, I started to write this uh, software <coughs> in 2011 uh, and at that time uh, there was not so many clients around uh, basically you had the choice uh, between running a full node and uh, uh, a hosted wallet uh, and uh, at s well multibit was already around I guess but it was also in the beginning 
Um, and uh, so uh, in the summer of 2011, there was this uh, mybitcoin.com fiasco, which uh, was a big uh, theft. Uh, so it was, it was a hosted wallet uh, that lost a lot of uh, bitcoins from their users. <laughs> so this, um, this happened uh, with a hosted wallet that was run by a person who was completely anonymous. Uh, which uh, of course uh, feels weird um, and uh, so I thought okay there will always be a demand for a wallet that gives you access to your coins instantly because people don't want to wait uh, to synchronize with the network uh, and we have to address this demand in a way that protects the users so um, so this is how I decided to, to, to write this, uh, this client uh, by uh, creating a, a client where uh, uh, the private keys never leave your computer and uh, but that can uh, connect to the server uh, with the speed of a web wallet and another aspect that was very important is uh, that it was uh, deterministic so instead of uh, having to do backups <coughs> of your of your private keys uh, every 10 days or so uh, you had uh, a unique uh, seed phrase that you could write on paper and uh, this would save your wallet once and for all. So what's the idea of, of, of this kind of wallet, of a, of a light wallet that uh, provided security and where you'd control your own private keys? Was that, was that a new idea at the time or isn't, isn't it mentioned in the white paper even? No, uh, of course it's mentioned in the white paper, this uh, SPV uh, Proof checking is mentioned in the Satoshi Nakamoto white paper, and uh, at that time, uh, Electrum was not the only one. There was also already another client that is uh, deterministic, which uh, is the ancestor of uh, Mycelium. At that time, it was called Bitcoin Spinner. So um, uh, <coughs> we were already uh, having this uh, this client for smartphones uh, called Bitcoin Spinner. And uh, Multibit was also in its early stages, so Bitcoin J was already being developed. And when we talk about the seed uh, and the HD part, I know I think isn't it BIP32, I think, the, the, the sort of standard way of doing that, but then I know some people also do it a different way. I think Armory you now has another system. Is How does Electrum do it? Is it does it use BIP32? Yes, it does use BIP32. Uh, but it's not using BIP39, which is uh, another standard. Uh, BIP32 is about how you derive addresses in a hierarchy. And BIP39 is about how do you convert <coughs> a, a seed phrase made of words, a mnemonic, uh, into uh, the, the private key or the root of your, of your hierarchy. So um, I have decided not to follow BIP39. So when we talk about HD wallets, then a lot of times we, we mention, you know, we'll mention BIP32. Uh, so there's actually another component to that, which is BIP39. So the BIP32 is how you derive the addresses. So it's like the, the chains, um, et cetera. And the BIP39 is actually like implementing the seed from which you derive those addresses. Uh, the seed phrase, yes. How do you take uh, words from natural language and you convert them into uh, address, a set of addresses? And why did you choose not to use the BIP39 impl implementation? Because I had the feeling that it was um, reproducing the same mistake as I did uh, with Electrum uh, when I started Electrum. Um, when you give uh, uh, this seed phrase to your users, you have uh, an obligation to support it in the future forever. You cannot uh, tell them, oh, look, this is a new version, so we are not going to, to support the old seeds, okay? You have to support the seeds that you give to your users in the future. There's no way you're going to tell them, look, we have decided to change and we do not support the old seed phrases. You have to switch because lots of users would lose their money if you did that. So. Um, when I started Electrum, 
I did not include a version number in uh, the seed, which means that the, the seeds that have been distributed, uh, we have to um, still support them, but uh, some collisions are possible with, with BIP39 seeds already. Uh, so, in the first place, it was not possible to fully support BIP39. And um, in addition, uh, BIP39 is uh, not including any version number either. It's just doing the same uh, as I did before. So, there's no way of tracking the evolution of BIP39. So, what you're saying is that since it doesn't have a version number, if there's a new version of BIP39 that comes out later, wallets wouldn't have a way to differentiate one version from another. I guess they might use uh, the checksum that they have currently in BIP39 as a version number, but it's not in the BIP currently. Um, another thing that uh, I don't like about this uh, BIP39 ID is that um, uh, when, you when you define a new standard, uh, you have to have a clear idea about what the goal is and uh, you have to see how to achieve this goal with a standard that is as minimal as possible. Uh, BIP39 includes the word list in the BIP. That means that uh, in the future, if you want to support BIP39 seeds because you have given them to your users, you will have to include this word list forever. Um, and I will have to do the same with the old Electrum seeds because the word list was uh, included in the standard. So that's another mistake that I will not do twice. Can you, can you explain why? So it's a problem because... Because it's very big. I mean, uh, it's a dictionary. And if you want to have it in many languages, you have to, to write these dic dictionaries in many languages and put it in the BIP. And uh, it's also a problem once you start to have collisions between those languages because they have words in common. So the first arrived can use a word and then another language that arrives later has to check what are the words that are already used by the previous ones. Now, does this, does this mean that the seeds that you use in your wallet would not be compatible with another wallet? No, they are not. But if a wallet, if another wallet wants to support the seeds used in Electrum, uh, it's very easy because they do not need a word list. It's just 10 lines of code and they will, they, they can support it much uh, easier. Um, the, the seeds that we use uh, do not require a word list and we can actually change the word list in the future. The old seeds will remain compatible because we only use a hash of the seed phrase. Um, BIP39 also, I mean, uh, BIP39, the first version was not doing that, and uh, then they decided to do this. So they also use a hash of the seed phrase, which in principle would allow them to do that. But the problem is that they did not do it for the checksum, which is not consistent. I just don't understand why they did it for the, for the, seed, deri for the seed derivation and not for the checksum. I mean, if you decide to, to go for a hash of the phrase, then uh, you should do it for both, not just for once. It doesn't make sense to me. So coming back to uh, to Electrum in a broader sense, so we just came out with uh, version 2.0. Uh, can you talk about some of the new features uh, in this latest release? Oh, which there uh, there are a lot of new features. <laughs> I know. I mean, you can look at the change log uh, on. The... Yeah, where do you want me to start? Well, which which ones are the most important? Or which ones are the most important to you? I guess. I think. Uh... Bip seventy is very important in my uh, in my view. So that's uh, payment requests. The payment protocol, yes. Um, and it's something that we are going to develop further. For the moment, the, the, the management of these invoices is not very well advanced, but we are going to, to develop this further. Uh, I think it's very important for, uh, uh, in terms of uh, customer protection, because without this uh, <coughs> payment request, Sorry. <coughs> uh, without payment request, um, you have to. Uh, a merchant will give you an address, uh, but um, 
then you can feel uncomfortable sending bitcoins to this address because you're not sure it really belongs to them. Yeah. Uh, with a payment request, they actually give you a proof that they asked you to send money to this address. So because, the, because there is a signature in this payment request, then the signature is linked to a domain name. So in terms of, uh, of consumer protection, I think it's much better. So how it does feel like when, so, so will the Electrum wallet, I, I mean, I guess most, most of us know uh, the payment requests from, for example, when they pay something with, uh, with BitPay, right? And BitPay yes. uh, sends an invoice and you see the address, you know, that it's basically like, uh, like a certificate authority with a, a website can authenticate that, well, this is from them. Uh, in the same way, right, BitPay basically certifies that, yes, this address comes from them. Um, how will this uh, feel for a user? So if, if then you go to a website, you try to buy something with BitPay and you click uh, a pay with that, will will you uh, display, for example, that invoice in the Electrum wallet? Yes. And w will you save those invoices for future reference? Yes. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah th this is what we do. Um, I did not post a screenshots on, on the website, but basically it's a little bit like in a Bitcoin core client. Um, it displays the, uh, the domain name that you are paying to. It uh, puts a green color if the um, uh, signature ver verification has passed. And uh, it will not let you pay if this uh, verification has failed or if the payment request has expired. I, I know there are, there are a lot of uh, other exciting features that you have. I mean, I know uh, one of the, the key ones is, uh, is multi-sig. Uh, and I, I think Electrum is the, the f after Armory, I guess, was the first wallet that had, you know, multi-sig, uh, not in a web way, right? Because there, there are a lot of uh, web wallets that have some sort of multi-sig features like BitGo, for example. Uh, but with, with Armory, you could actually, you know, each has your own local wallet running a full node and you could do our uh, multi-sig. I think that was the first one, if I'm correct, with their lockboxes thing. Uh, and now, uh, I don't know, is, is this the, the second, uh, like, implementation of multi-sig for, uh, in this way? Or, or can you explain a little bit maybe how this compares to, uh, to other ways of doing multi-sig that are more uh, web-based? I think the very first one was uh, just uh, the Bitcoin Core client, even mm. though it was not in the user interface, but it was with the command line. Yeah. Armory was the first and maybe the only one to, um, to have um, uh, multi-sig without pay to script hash, if uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that their lock service is uh, using multi-sig um, even from before this uh, pay-to-script hash uh, uh, system. Yeah, I believe that's true. And this allows them to, to uh, put uh, an arbitrary number of, uh, of uh, cosigners. Electrum use, uh, uses pay-to-script hash. And so uh, out of the box with this new version, we can do uh, two to two of two multi-sig and two of three multi-sig. Yeah, we're going to add more in the future, I guess. Okay. Um, now, can you just talk about how that works? So for instance, say I have a wallet uh, here in France and, and Brian has a wallet uh, in Berlin on his computer and we want to do multi-sig. How do we set that up and how do we uh, let the other person know that there's a transaction so that he can sign? You guys have to exchange uh, master public keys. And uh, unfortunately for that part, uh, we, we do not have a, a way to do it within Electrum. But uh, you, can, you can transfer a, a master public key um, either with a file or with a QR code. So, so then can you run us uh, through a transaction? Let's say we, wanna, we, we have uh, funds in a multi-sig uh, multi address and we want to pay uh, something yeah. and uh, you know, I have one signature, let's say it's a two out of two. I have one signature and Sebastian has one signature. Yeah. Um, how would that then go? Would, would I, for example, initialize the payment and it shows up in his address and he has to uh, co-sign it? Or is there some way I 
have to send him the, the incomplete or partially signed transaction? That's right. Um, so you have multiple ways to do this. Uh, you can send him the partially signed transaction. Uh, we also have a new plugin uh, in this new release that uh, uses a centralized server. And uh, this server is a channel of communication for multi-sig wallets. So uh, it's called Cosigner Pool. Uh, it's like a memory pool, but for transactions that are not uh, signed yet. <coughs> And um, so uh, you sign your part, I mean, you sign the transaction with your signature. And then uh, this transaction uh, is going to be encrypted uh, with the public key of your cosigner and is going to go on the server with this uh, encryption. And uh, the cosigner is going to put it uh, in a table indexed by not the public key of the cosigner, but, but a hash of this public key. So that the server does not even have access to the public key of the cosigner. And when you start, when the cosigner starts their wallet, uh, they get, just get a pop-up that tells them, oh, you have received a, a partially signed transaction uh, from the cosigner pool. Uh, please type you, your password to decrypt it, uh, assuming they have uh, encryption uh, of their seed. And once they do that, they see this transaction that is decrypted and uh, they can decide to cosign it and then to broadcast it. So at no point does, because you just said something that we probably lost about half the people that were watching. You said centralized server. Yeah. Now, uh, so the, the, what, what's important to realize though is that the transaction is, uh, is encrypted and the server never has access to the contents of that transaction. Yeah, uh, we can also mention that there is a currently going effort to do the same thing in a in a decentralized way. Um, I think the author of uh, Bitcoin Authenticator, Chris Pachia, is, uh, is working on, on, that, uh, on that project. But for the moment, it's not, uh, it's not ready. Okay, so this is a plugin that, uh, that is developed on top of, of, of Electrum. Uh, now there's another interesting plugin that I, so if, for instance, if we were using the same um, we were using a multi-sig uh, wallet and from the same seed. So if, let's say, for instance, well, in our case, we're a business. We, we have one wallet and we want to have access to the same wallet on two computers and be able to sign transactions with multi-sig. Uh, one thing that might be important to share is labels of addresses. So we could send invoices and receive payments and we want to uh, make sure that those labels are synced across yes. both wallets. So you also have a plugin yes, that and, uh, enables that. You, you asked me last week about that and uh, in the meantime, it has been fixed. I so, saw that. <laughs> so you saw that. Okay, that's fine. That's I'm, fine. Looking at the, I'm looking at the chains release right now. So yeah, okay. I, I just realized that. So if you, if you have two cosigner that have this uh, labels plugin, their labels will synchronize. That's great. So, so this, I guess in, in that case then, um, that solves the the issue of well, what what a lot of web wallets uh, solve as a problem, which is synchronizing of labels. Uh, but we can so Electrum can do that uh, on the desktop. Yeah. So we'll uh, come back to Electrum in just a minute. Uh, we want to talk about SPV as well as uh, the Bitcoin aliases uh, initiative that uh, Tama is standing behind. And um, also just sort of talk about the wallet space in general. But before we do that, we'd like to talk about our good friends over at Shapeshift. Shapeshift is the fast and easy way to uh, buy and sell altcoins. I just checked their website and they now support 25 altcoins, including unobtainium. Um, so <laughs> if you thought that you couldn't get your hands on some unobtainium, you can even get unobtainium with Shapeshift. Um, so Shapeshift is uh, basically a currency converter. Uh, f I mean, I, I consider it to be sort of Google Translate for cryptocurrencies. On one side, you have the currency, the currency you want to convert. On the other side, you have the currency you want to convert to. And uh, you just send the, uh, so for instance, you send Bitcoin and you want a Dogecoin. You put your Dogecoin address on the, uh, in their conversion tool and it'll send Dogecoin to your, to your wallet. Zero transactions takes about 30 seconds to do, and they don't even need uh, an account. So you can do it completely 
transparently uh, pr protecting your privacy without having to create an account. So uh, one thing that we've been doing recently is uh, tipping um, interesting uh, things that are in related to the show. Uh, and uh, well, perhaps we could use Shapeshift to tip uh, Electrum. Tama, is there a tipping address? Uh, no, there is no tipping address um, for Electrum itself. Oh, um, <laughs> that's too bad. I think we could probably tip one of the servers, though. Yeah, you, this is what I answer to people when they ask me uh, if, if they can donate to Electrum. Uh, they can donate to the people who are operating Electrum servers. Okay, so in that case, then, uh, let's, let's do that. Um, so w where do we find the server address? Well, I found one. You so found one. I, I went on, uh, on my Electrum uh, wallet and I looked at one of the tips here. So there's a server over in California and we'll uh, use Shapeshift to tip in Dogecoin. So if I go to shapeshift.io, so here I've got my currency conversion tool. On one side I've got BTC and on the other side I've got Litecoin. So I'm going to send Dogecoin and I send that to Bitcoin, put the address in, I hit start. And using my Dogecoin wallet, I will simply send some Dogecoin over to that address. So we'll say $1. There you go. So I've just sent uh, $1 to that address. And in just a few seconds, they'll get uh, Bitcoin um, in their tipping pool. So shapeshift.io, give it a try. Tell us what you think. And we, which, uh, which server was that? Uh, I think it's the... Uh, electrum.hsmiths.com in California. Okay. So yeah, go to shapeshift.io, give it a try, tell us what you think, and we'd like to thank them for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. Absolutely. So uh, let's let's dive into the SPV topic a bit because it, it's a it's an interesting topic. It's also kind of a complicated topic, and 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 uh, maybe it also gives us a chance to come back a bit about the the thing uh, Sebastian just raised before the issue of uh, Electrum using a server. And what kind of the, the trade-offs are there of using a server or not? So we we mentioned a little bit um, before. Uh, you mentioned that the sort of idea, right, that people don't want to sync the whole blockchain. It's a pain. I mean, I personally, I have I've used Armory, and uh, it's it's just it's a really a kind of a nightmare. I find it because uh, having the Bitcoin blockchain updated. Oh, you know, uh, it's it's a pain when when you have to wait hours each time you use it. So, uh, perhaps to get started with with the SPV thing, can you tell us what are the the kind of compromises and security trade offs one makes when one one chooses to use an SPV wallet versus using a, a, a running a full node uh, client like, like Armory or or maybe the Bitcoin QT. So um, with an SPV client, um, your client can check that the transactions it receives <coughs> from the network are actually in the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, but it is not a proof that uh, you received all the information. It's a, it's a proof of, uh, of correctness, but not the proof of completeness. Um, so, um, so this is one of the of the trade-offs <laughs> that you are making. So, so what's what's the worst thing that could happen because uh, you don't have a you don't have that proof of completeness? Nothing really bad, actually, but still, um, uh, you could think that uh, if you are in a in a non-secure environment and someone is uh, is controlling your, your connection, uh, they can make you believe that you are talking to the Bitcoin network, but you are not. <laughs> and they can hide some transactions that actually landed in your wallet. So the worst thing that would happen would be that uh, your wallet gives you incorrect uh, balances or? Yes, um, but... Um, they cannot make you believe that you have uh, received some bitcoins, uh, which is the because SPV protects you against that. They could make you believe that uh, you failed to send some bitcoins, and actually, uh, being a deterministic client also protects you against that because if you want to, if the network tells you that a, a transaction did not go through. 
uh, and you try to send it again, you're going to send exactly the same transactions with the same coins. So, yeah, so it wouldn't be that somebody uh, tries to get you to pay an invoice uh, and you use an SPV wallet and then they, I guess, control your network uh, and somehow they make you believe you didn't pay and then uh, you pay twice with some other inputs, but that, that couldn't happen there. Well, you would pay twice with the same inputs, so you would pay only once. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's interesting, no? Because we, we often have this idea. I mean, there, there is this idea that SPV wallets are somehow insecure or at least somewhat insecure. Uh, but that's, I mean, those seem like fairly minor things. Plus, they, it, I mean, it also seems that an attacker would need a, a lot of skill and control your network. I mean, these are pretty... Uh, an, attack, an attacker can also make you believe that you have not been paid. Yeah. They cannot make you believe that you have been paid. And that's important if you're a merchant because you are going to send some goods. But they can make you believe that you have not been paid. Yeah. So, but still, it, it, I mean, I, I'm trying to think of some scenario where this would be like some, some terrible situation. And, and maybe someone can, can opt with can come up with one, but it's... It's... Um, SPV is a very good protection, actually. But if we can do better, we have to do better. And um, one of the things that I want to do for, for Electrum is uh, to add also this other proof, this proof of completeness to the Electrum protocol. Um, so there is this idea that was uh, mentioned uh, some time ago in the Bitcoin forums of uh, it is called um, blockchain commitments and it, re it requires the miners to uh, put in every block the, the root hash of a tree, um, a tree of all the unspent. So uh, this is probably never going to happen because uh, it, it would be a hard fork and it would be complicated. Um, and the miners, yeah, well, um, uh, so there, there would be another way to do this without requiring the miners collaboration. It's, um, it's been described in a paper that was published last year. It's called, uh, Versum, V-E-R-S-U-M. It's an MIT paper. And, uh, so this is a protocol that uh, allows you to uh, connect to a bunch of servers and um, actually you need only one of them to be honest and you can't find which one is honest just because the server is going to send you a proof and uh, so you, you request a proof of your of your balance for each block and um, you can go for, from one block to the next one and check the, the transition between blocks so you can do, I mean, if you, if you need to know, uh, if you have this proof for a block in the past and you want to have it for a block in the future, you can do a dichotomy very quickly and find out uh, if two servers disagree which one is the liar. So this, uh, this is uh, something that we, that we want to, to add to Electrum in the future. Cool. So uh, one of the things we also mentioned was that uh, Electrum uses uh, a server, right? So with normal SPV wallets, they, they just talk to the Bitcoin network, uh, Electrum uh, wallets talk to Electrum servers and, and uh, you operate one of them and there are other people operating one of them. Uh, why did you choose to go that way and not, not just talk to the Bitcoin network? Because it allows to have a, a synchronization that is uh, almost instant. Okay. And uh, the, the trade-off, I guess, is that you do lose some privacy, or, or is, that, is that true? It depends. Um, you do expose your wallet addresses to the server that you are talking to. In that sense, you lose some privacy. Uh, now, if you look at um, the other technique that is around, which, which is the Bloom filter, uh, the Bloom filter uh, also uh, leaks some information. Actually, you have to to uh, decide if you want speed or privacy, but you can't have both. Um, and uh, so you can make your Bloom filter more or less specific. And if it's very specific, it's very fast. But then it's also going to 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 leak some some information about your addresses. Um, 
But in this case, uh, you're leaking this information to the entire world, not just to a single server, because the communication is not encrypted. So what is a, a, a Bloom filter? Can you explain that briefly? A Bloom filter is a reduced uh, vector that uh, does not reveal your addresses, uh, but it tells uh, the node that you are talking to uh, what is the set of addresses that you might be interested in. So uh, there might be some false positives um, uh, in, the, in the answer that you get because uh, the node actually does not know your addresses. They just uh, run this Bloom filter against each block and they uh, they can filter the the block and uh, a few transactions will be remaining these are the transactions that you might be interested in so if you synchronize with the blockchain using a bloom filter you do not download the full blocks but a very very reduced version of the blocks and so when you when you query the network about these transactions the the node will return back more transactions. Is that is that understand right? Like the node will return more transactions than you need, and so therefore it doesn't know exactly what your addresses are. Or am I completely getting there wrong? And that's the idea. Um, then uh, it depends on how the Bloom filter is set. Uh, it can be very very specific or not specific at all. If it's not specific at all, basically you're downloading the full block. Right. And if it's very specific, then you are much less private. Okay. And so, so how does that relate to how differently your implementation of SPV is from, say, uh, a Bitcoin J based wallet? It makes no difference for SPV. SPV is uh, is about the verification of the of the information that you get. Um, Electrum and Bitcoin J have a different way of uh, querying your history. But then SPV is the same. SPV doesn't care if you if you use a server or not. Okay, so that's clear. But uh, uh, I guess one one question comes up here, especially if one is very concerned about uh, about privacy, and and if we if you sort of take uh, you know put on the NSA hat, like uh, assuming the NSA is trying to get some, for example, some sort of surveillance of what's going on with the blockchain. Uh, where would one be more secure here? I mean, I, I guess one thing they could do is would be operate directly on the Electrum server. The other thing they could do would be uh, maybe operate some Bitcoin nodes or, or try to get some visibility into the transactions that are going on and maybe which IP addresses are doing certain transactions that way. Um, where would you be more comfortable here? And, and how, do you, how do you see those, uh, the risks there? Um, well, if you really want to be anonymous, uh, you, uh, I think it's better to roll a full node. Um, if you want to use Electrum, uh, you can also use your own private server and then you have a full node and you're anonymous. Um, or you have to trust the server that you are using, that they are not going to leak information about you. Uh, now. Um, my target is not really people who are already using full nodes and who wants to be very anonymous. Uh, I am more interested in two users that currently use uh, web wallets like uh, blockchain.info and uh, this kind of wallet does not do SPV and uh, they use JavaScript. So this is the, the kind of um, people that uh, I am targeting. Uh, but if uh, you are highly concerned about your privacy, uh, there are two ways you can use Electrum. Uh, you can run your own server and talk only to that server. Or you can uh, decide that you trust one of them and uh, stick to this one. But uh, yeah, that's all. Uh, like I said, if, you, if you're really uh, concerned about privacy, uh, yeah it's better to use a full node because uh, neither Electrum nor the, the, the Bloom filter will, uh, will really make you very private. Yeah, okay, no, so that makes, uh, that makes sense, right? Because of course, when you, when you receive the transactions, uh, but, but then uh, still the, the question is when you run a full node, 
uh, I mean, I, it makes sense to me that, you know, the receiving the transactions would work, uh, you know, if you get all the transactions in, obviously nobody would know anything about you based on you looking for specific transactions to specific addresses. But then when you send the transactions, wouldn't you still uh, leak information when you run a full node? Mm, you can use Electrum over Tor and you don't leak your IP. So what, the information that you are leaking is only your addresses and uh, you are <coughs> disclosing it only to one person, which is the server, the person who is operating this server. You're not uh, leaking it to the entire world because the connection between you and this server is authenticated and is encrypted. Uh, this authentication is also a good protection in case of uh, a man in the middle attack, by the way. Yeah, I, I mean, in this case, I meant to the, if you're running a full node, actually, that, that then if you send a transaction, uh, well, oh. if, I mean, you must send it to some node, right? So that node yeah. will will know uh, you sending a, a transaction, right? So you will leak I I information about your addresses uh, in that way. No, if you're running a full node, you just, uh, no, you don't really leak information about your addresses. Uh, only if uh, people around you can tell that uh, you're the very first one to relay that transaction. Yeah, yeah. But this is difficult. Yeah, okay, yeah, because uh, it could always be that that transaction, that signed transaction you're sending on to some other node, the other node doesn't know whether it originated from you or whether it came from somewhere else, right? They can they can try to measure this, but uh, I I don't know how reliable that is. Uh, if if you look at uh, blockchain.info, they actually have a, a map where you can see where a trans uh, transaction uh, or originates from, and it's not uh, it's not reliable at all. So Thomas, recently you gave a talk at a meetup in Berlin about an idea that has been on the mind of many people for many years. I think it's it's sort of a, an obvious idea, which is uh, to make sending Bitcoins really easily and to allow people to send Bitcoins uh, to email addresses or to some sort of a human readable format. Of course, some people have done that, right? Like Circle and Coinbase and stuff. But, you know, it's in a very uh, lousy centralized way where essentially you are sending, you know, I can send Bitcoins to some email address and they get a notification essentially to create a Coinbase account, for example. And of course, that's not really what we want because it, centralization, it doesn't really work in, in the way Bitcoin is supposed to work. But your proposal is trying to accomplish that. So can you uh, talk a bit about how this is uh, supposed to happen? Yes. Um, well, uh, in the current uh, Electrum 2.0, we have uh, an open alias plugin that uh, lets users send uh, Bitcoins to an alias that reads like an email address. Uh, now, what I want to do is something a, a little bit different. I would like to have a user experience where you do not see a Bitcoin address at all. And uh, for that, I think that uh, the payment protocol has to be uh, extended. Currently, the, the payment protocol is very nice, but um, if you want to sign a payment request, you need the SSL certificate. So the, the, the payment request is signed by a domain name. What I would like to have is a payment request that can be signed by a user at the domain name. So uh, uh, this signature would not be uh, a signature that is uh, coming from the private key of uh, SSL certificate. Uh, but uh, a Bitcoin, uh, a CDSA signature. So um, I think uh, in order to do that, uh, we need to extend this uh, payment protocol just to have a, a final step where the, the person who has the certificate for a domain would issue, uh, let's call it new certificates, but for, for, for Bitcoin users. Uh, so that uh, each user can sign a payment request with uh, with uh, their wallet uh, address, a dedicated uh, key in their wallet would, would do that. Uh, 
So we were talking about uh, the payment request idea. Would this also allow me to, for example, send Bitcoins, uh, let's say to Sebastian, if I, you know, I don't know any Bitcoin address from him and I know maybe he uses Bitcoin. Uh, could I just send one, uh, send some Bitcoins uh, to his email address? No, you could, he could send the payment request to your email address. And right. then okay, you, yeah. you would pay but the, the, the requester has to initiate the process. Okay. So I was curious if, if there was any other projects uh, or anybody else trying to, attempting to do this. So uh, there's like one named .org and Keybase that sort of trying to remove the Bitcoin address. Um, yeah, yeah, there, there is a lot of projects around there. Um, but I do like uh, the idea of this uh, payment protocol um, because uh, it feels more safer to send uh, uh, to send bitcoins only when someone re requests them from you. Now, is there are there ways? So this is a, this is a way for someone to initiate a payment request and then someone to send the money. So it is, it is receiver controlled, which is ideal in some cases. In other cases, it may be a ideal for um, the payment to be sender controlled. So, like Brian was uh, was mentioning, uh, I, I want to send money to this person. I I know they use Bitcoin. Um, maybe they've set up something that allows me to send them money uh, using the domain no, domain name. Well, uh, this would be uh, working with uh, the current uh, Open Alias plugin. Uh, we can uh, uh, we we already have that in Electron. So in that case, uh, it's a different process because the verification of uh, of the alias is not uh, using uh, SSL certificates at all. It's using uh, the DNS and DNSSEC. But in terms of user experience, it's uh, it's what you are describing. Uh, you you do not request uh, payment, but you want to send bitcoins to someone, and you suspect that they have an address somewhere. Now, so I've I've been reading about Open Alias, and I actually I set it up on our uh, on our domain name. It's pretty easy. I just have to set up a text uh, um, a DNS record. Do you know if that could also work with XPub? So that any time I put, so for example, I want to send money to this domain name, um, they would generate and it would find sort of the the last address that where a payment has not been sent. Mm, no, I don't know. I'm sorry. No, but so, yeah, I, I also think this is sort of needed um, because we really need to get rid of these addresses that, <laughs> um, but there seems to be a lot of challenges with this because uh, maybe, maybe, like, would this still work if you changed, if you had like a new wallet um, or if you changed wallet providers or perhaps started a new seed, like you'd have to set that up again, even with what you're describing? Yes, you would have to revoke your certificate or, or buy a new one. Today's magic word is SEED, S-E-E-D. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. Um, so moving on just before we wrap up, uh, We'd like to end on sort of uh, exploring the, the the wallet space. Uh, what are your thoughts on the current sort of offering of, of Bitcoin wallets out there right now? So in, in the last year, there's been like a proliferation of wallets uh, coming out. It seems like a lot of people are focusing on this. Why do you think that is? I started this uh, because I found it was interesting, and uh, I think. Uh, Lots of people, when they, they discover Bitcoin, they want to play with it. So it's very natural to, to tinker with, uh, with addresses and uh, to, uh, why not then to start to write a wallet. It's, um, yeah, it's, uh, there might be more and more in the future. Uh, so uh, do you also think, uh, I know this uh, ties into Sebastian's question, uh, that the wallet will be um will be key to building the sort of bitcoin i don't know businesses of the future uh, i know there's, there's certainly the viewpoint that i guess because 
you know, in a sense, it's like it's a central point, right, where where people control their funds and maybe where you would use other services from. And if you look at the big fundraising runs uh, in the last year, right, there was Coinbase, Zappos, uh, Blockchain, uh, BitGo, uh, uh, many of these companies uh, all focusing on wallets. Uh, so is, is that also uh, your point of view that, that the wallet, because of that central position, will be you know, sort of essential to building significant businesses in this space? I do not know. Um, I believe that there is uh, some uh, monetization possibilities, uh, but um, it's also a very competitive uh, domain. Uh, now, um, I guess there will be uh, two kind of uh, wallets. I mean, wallets that also provide financial services uh, that let you exchange actually buy buy bitcoins with uh, with euros, and uh, and uh, there will also there will be uh, wallets like uh, software wallet that are actually manage your keys, and this is uh, what uh, desktop applications are, are doing. But I don't know if these two uh, different worlds are going to to mix. Uh, and uh, if we are going to see some hybrid uh, products. So in, in your case, what are some of the oppor monetization opportunities that uh, you perhaps see in the future of uh, Electrum? Um, in the present, uh, we have uh, started to uh, provide this two-factor two authentication service, uh, which is a, a collaboration between Electrum and a company called TrustedCoin.com. Um, and it's a unique uh, uh, way to do uh, two-factor authentication because it's fully deterministic. So <coughs> that means that uh, you can recover your funds from your seed even if, uh, even in the event where this company, Trusted Coin, disappears. Um, because uh, it's a two of three wallet. You have two keys. They have the third key. But the so 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 that already gives you the the control over your coins. But uh, it's important to understand that the third key, the public key, is also deterministic, and you can regenerate it on your side without them. So if you have a, a whole bunch of addresses in this wallet, uh, it can be restored like a normal Electrum wallet without uh, this company, without their servers. So you are, you are perfectly safe if you use trusted coin. So and then is uh, is there a model that with each transaction you pay, for example, a small fee to a trusted coin, or, or is it a yeah okay? Um, you can choose either you pay on each transaction, or you can buy some prepaid transaction, and then uh, it's uh, fifty percent less. Yeah, I I think that's an interesting thing. I remember uh, that's a long 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 time ago when we had uh, Johan Barbie of 37 coins on and, and they had sort of a similar model uh, where, you know, they, they would essentially provide a second factor and they would sign transactions. And, and in this way, um, in this way, it, pro it provides like um, advantages of both worlds, right? On the one hand, you don't hold people's funds, so they still control them. You only have one key, you can't steal them. But at the same time, you're like essential in every transaction. So it, it can offer a good uh, business model possibility, you know, because uh, you can sort of by default include a fee to yourself. Um, and yeah, I, th I think that that sounds like a, a very reasonable way. Uh, but if we think, you know, long term, where, where do you see Electrum in, uh, in three years or in five years? Uh, in five years? Oh, my God. I know this is a, a this is a crazy question in Bitcoin <laughs> Bitcoin terms, but uh, you know if if we or, or, or maybe as far as you can see, let's say three years. Okay, uh, I think that uh, this idea of uh, uh, using uh, email-like aliases uh, to to send payment requests um, will be implemented in the coming year. Um, the other thing that uh, will uh, be important for us is to be more uh, present on the Android platform. For the moment, we do have an Android version of Electrum, but it's not very user friendly because it's using a, a deprecated uh, um, API from Google. Um, we have uh, 
uh, currently under development, uh, a new Android application that is used in Kiwi, which is a, 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 an Android uh, development uh, framework, which is uh, much better. <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, I don't know how much time it's going to take, but uh, maybe one year for those two things. Uh, and then, um, then there is this, uh, this uh, proof of completeness which requires a change in the protocol. This is probably going to take a bit more time. It depends how I set my priorities. Uh, for the moment, my, pri my priority will, will be this uh, aliases. And, and what about Electrum uh, as a company? Do you anticipate uh, hiring people and, and building this into a larger project or do you hope to just monetize uh, the open source software in a way that you can support yourself and, and keep working on providing sort of, you know, great open source free uh, Bitcoin software? Yes, um, for the moment it's an experiment. Uh, I'm going to uh, see um, how much uh, revenue I can generate uh, and of course uh, if I can pay more than one person then I will hire someone um, it's uh, uh, <coughs> we, we need uh, we need actually uh, someone to to be full-time on this Android uh, development okay cool uh, now, now in terms of business model um, uh, we do have uh, this product that is out now. Uh, I think it's time to uh, look for other kind of services that we can provide. And there is a there is a lot of things that we can do inside a, wa a wallet. Um, one thing that I did not mention is um, this idea of uh, auditing Bitcoin exchanges uh, in order to check that uh, they actually have uh, your funds in their reserves. This is something that uh, could be done uh, by software. And uh, this is a service for which uh, um, we are looking to, to find some collaboration with, uh, with Bitcoin exchanges. Cool, excellent. Well, um, thanks so much for coming on uh, today, Thomas. Yeah, thank you, for, thank you for having me. Yeah, so if people want to learn more about Electrum, uh, the domain is electrum.org. Of course, we will have the link in the show notes. Um, also, I guess uh, we can link to the GitHub page. So if people, you know, I don't know, want to look at the code or maybe get involved uh, even in contributing to the project, so, uh, you know, they'll be able to do that as well. Is there something else or some other place you want to appoint people to? Yeah, they can also contribute to the documentation. Actually, now that we have released 2.0 in the next month, uh, uh, our main effort will be to write documentation because we have a lot of new features and uh, uh, they are not properly documented. And uh, I can write some documentation, but it's much better if it's written by someone else who does not have the view of a developer. Uh, I, so I can write like a first version of this documentation and then I hope some people will uh, rephrase what I write in a, in a better way. Okay, well, uh, fantastic. So yeah, thanks so much for coming on, Tomas. And you know, to a listener, thanks very much for listening. Uh, we will, so you can do a few things uh, to support us. You can follow us on Twitter at Epicenter BTC, uh, and you can also uh, donate to us. We, you know, we do appreciate that. And you can do that at epicenterbitcoin.com slash tips. Um, so thanks so much for listening and we look forward to being back next week. Mm -hmm.